Well, good morning, Brainerd Baptist family. Thanks for being with us this morning. Can we thank Connie Money for that beautiful prelude, a beautiful doxology of praise as we begin our service this morning. We're grateful we have some guests here today. We have a group from a Mission Serve is what they call this particular ministry. And I was handed this piece of paper, so I'm going to cheat on here, okay, and tell you who they are. This is a combination of two youth ministries from the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Dr. Shaddix, you can resonate with that. Dr. Shaddix, our interim pastor is from that area, Wake Forest. So we appreciate y'all being here with us. They're uh, serving in various projects around our community in Chattanooga with home repair, painting, community service, partnering with uh, Hope for the Inner City Ministries as well. They're here from July the 9th through the 16th. Can we make them feel welcome and thank them for being with us? Thank you for serving us and serving us so well. Psalm 47, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of the trumpet. Sing praises to God, people. Sing praises. Sing praises to our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Let's stand together as we sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. I hope that you can pray and say that today, that he is your Savior. And proclaim that Jesus Christ is mine.
Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. For he is our Lord and Savior and our King, and he is much more than that. We could spend all day talking about the wonderful attributes of the Lord. Amen. He is our way maker. He is our promise keeper. He is our stronghold. He is our refuge. We could go all day with different things that we love about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this song is called Waymaker.
Kendra, thank you. Great singing, church. Please be seated. Thank you.
Good morning, church. My name is Josiah, and I have the privilege to serve here as one of our pastors. And uh, let me just stop and say, off the, especially the last two songs, really all three of them, man, praise the Lord. God is still at work at Brainerd Baptist. And uh, if, yeah, give the Lord a hand. If y'all didn't hear anything about the last uh, month here at Brainerd and God's goodness and grace over BBS and kids camp and student camp, and things happening, I get the privilege to hear things happening abroad in the missions office. Uh, can I just tell you that if you're not involved in the ministries here and you're just attending on Sunday morning, you are really, really missing out. So let me encourage you just to plug for that. Uh, get involved in the ministries of the church. And these songs here will continue to bless you and just emphasize what God is already doing here. So on that note, uh, can we just pray for a second? And I'm going to change the order of our you know service right here for a second. Give Praise to Jesus for those things. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are sovereign, you are faithful. God, through all the things in life, through all the things at Brainerd Baptist, through all the things in ministries, ups and downs and highs and lows, God, you are the way maker. God, you are the light that goes before us. You are still healing us. God, the kids that came to faith in Jesus at kids camp, God, their eternity is changed forever. God, the, the kids and the parents and the adults abroad who are ministering for your namesake, who are taking the gospel to the nations, you are still at work here at Brainerd Baptist. God, we are so thankful for all of your church who's involved. We are so thankful for your church who's taking the hands and feet to those who need it. We're thankful for Jim Shaddix and Kevin Baggett who preach week in and week out. God, I pray this morning that as... Dr. Shaddix and Dr. Baggett, as they bring the word, God, that our hearts would be soft and that we would continue to turn to you, toward you. Father, if there's people in this room who don't know you, God, that they would come to faith in Jesus and that their eternity would be changed forever. And so we give this service again to you, God. We give this day to you. We worship you, even through this short time of announcements, God, that, that your Holy Spirit would continue to work today. And so we love you and we worship you, all sovereign God. Amen. Okay, now for the announcements. Uh, quick thing, uh, there's a bunch of these bottles in the back. So again, God is working. There's lots of ministry. Thank you all for contributing to Choices Pregnancy Center and giving to, to that need where they have a security need and Choices Pregnancy Center are helping ladies choose life. In church, putting the hands and feet behind all the social media posts right here, we love it. Thank you all for doing that. If you want to continue to contribute because y'all are so amazing when we ran out of bottles, you can do that straight online at, uh, or right online at choiceschattanooga.org. You can continue to contribute to that. And then uh, this Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m., again, off of the awesome things happening at student camp and kids camp, the students are going to have a time of worship. Honestly, all y'all are welcome. It'd be amazing to, con to come out and uh, support that. But a time of worship, if you're a student in here, 6.30 this Wednesday night up at the BX. And then, I don't recognize that second announcement. All this information can be found online. Um, there's something... <laughs> I'm sorry, I have no idea what that is about. Uh, so I'm just going to do the third one. <laughs> Members meeting, which is something very important uh, that all of your, uh, the budget will be decided on and talked about at, at the members meeting on the 24th. I apologize for being out of order. I'm sure that's on me. So anyways, as we continue in worship today, we're going to see what God's doing around the, uh, around the world. And then Dr. Shax will bring the word to us. As a team and as a community of believers, God has given us a mission. God compels us together to reach a massive city. Whoa. 
Mexico City is a free for all. A lot of traffic. Traffic, terrible traffic. There are things that can happen. They're not the worst things in the world. Everybody's in a hurry. Getting anywhere takes forever. Millions and millions of people coming in from Europe, South America. Cultural influences from all over the world that you find here in business and art and music. From Germany, from the Middle East, from Africa, from China. From unreached people groups around the world. They're not an isolated country full of mariachis. Where are the unreached places? Who are the unreached people? It's hard to know kind of where to begin. There's so many pockets of different areas, of different groups. Jewish, Mexicans, Germans. A Lebanese community. So this city has a reach worldwide, and we want to follow those lines to take the gospel all over the world. The Lord has put together a team of incredible people. Who are humble and are submissive to one another. When I look at our team, we are a small representation of what Mexico is. Cuban-American, a girl from Memphis, Koreans. I was born in Cuba. Lily was born in Colombia. Todd Beal, I think he's like a descendant of a Cherokee chief or something like that. Different experiences, different backgrounds. The dynamic of working together as a team is there's so much that we can offer together. Trabajar unidos con diferentes dones con un mismo propósito, Jesucristo. Mega City presents a lot of challenges. Their fellowship time is, is not with their next door neighbor. Their fellowship are the connections they have through their works. How do you minister in a world like that? Most ministry happens at night because that's when people are home. So you have to be willing to be at someone's house till midnight, whatever it takes. That burden of lostness, I think it weighs heavy on all of us on the team. Because we're only a team of 12 people and there's 28 million people, we can't reach them by ourselves. We're seeking to leverage, to mobilize, to, to be catalytic in the way that we're working. Invitan para conferencias el internet, el Skype. Tengo grupos de Cali, Colombia. Tengo grupos de Italia. Tengo grupos en todo lugar. Mentoring with guys who are studying here at this campus, especially the guys who are interested in pastoring or missions or sensing some kind of a calling. We're trying to team together with our national partners here. Working with the seminaries. The local churches, as well as folks who are coming down from our Baptist churches in the States. Limitless partners from the United States. So to be able to get the gospel in their homes and in their hearts. We cannot do it alone. God's still calling people. He hasn't stopped not just to be pastors, not just to be teachers, not just to be local missionaries, but to reach all the nations. Good morning, church. Uh, let's continue to worship the Lord through the study of his word. First Peter chapter three in your Bible. Let me ask you to open at that place. 1 Peter 3, if you came in today and don't have a copy of the Bible, there's some in the racks in front of you, and I hope you'll take one of those out if you're here in the room. Uh, those of you that are joining us online, thank you for doing that. We're so glad that you're part of this, and um, hope that you have a Bible close by and join us in this uh, journey through 1 Peter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. I'm going to read uh, verses 18 uh, in chapter 3 all the way through verse 6 of chapter 4. I don't know whose bright idea it was for us to cover this much ground uh, this morning. Uh, we're probably not going to make it. If you talk to any other preaching pastors and they tell you that it was my idea, don't believe them, okay? Um uh, it actually was, I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know what I was thinking. But um, there's a really, really good chance that we'll get down the road here in a little bit, and I'm going to have to say uh, we're going to have to stop. Actually, Josiah, I wish he hadn't had to go. He gave me a great idea when he was doing his announcement. I could just say to you, hey, all this stuff is online anyway, so just, uh, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> Because if it's on the internet, you know it's true, right? Uh, so, yeah, not so much. Peter's the human author, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that makes this God's word for us. First Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, 
in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formally didn't obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. I've told you before what some of you, many of you have experienced yourself, and that is sometimes I'm, I'm reading the Bible and I, you know, I, just, I, I run across something that I just have to stop and say, I'm so glad that's in there. Something that just I, I can identify with so much that I just have to, to say I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that that's in the Bible. I want to read you one of those places. You don't have to turn to it. I'm always hesitant about reading another passage of Scripture this early, you know, because I don't want to divert from the fact that we're studying this text, but I want to, I want to use this other text to illustrate for you what, what I think Peter is saying in this passage of Scripture. Again, you don't need to turn to it, but I want to read Romans chapter 7. Many of you will recognize this immediately. The Apostle Paul is writing, and he says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I don't do the good that I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I don't want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members, in my body, another law, a waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You ever feel like that? I mean, I, I'm so encouraged by the fact that not only is that in the Bible, but the apostle Paul wrote it. Because I live there so often, I, I know what's right, and, and I know what the Spirit of God in me is leading me to do, but so often I find myself doing just the opposite of that. And I, I, I want to do what's right, I want to do the good thing, I want to do the right thing, but there's something that pulls me away in the other direction. I read that and I just say, man, I, I, I can identify with that. Well, here's the connection. I think that what Peter is doing in the last part of chapter three and the first part of chapter six is that he is saying to believers in Jesus Christ, there is no time that you will experience that temptation more than when you are suffering for righteousness. When the world is hating on you, your friends are pushing back against you, they're turning your backs on you because you are trying to live for Jesus. You're trying to do what's right. And so they push back on you, they, they're coming against you. I think Peter is saying there's no time that we will be more tempted because of this war that goes on in our flesh. 
the war in which our bodies, our, our, our sinful bodies are pulling against our righteous spirit, the spirit of Jesus that lives inside of us, there is no time that we will be more tempted to throw in the towel, to wave a, a white flag and say, I'm just going to give up. I can't do it. I can't live righteously. I can't do, I can't do what's right. I think Peter knew that one of the greatest times, if not the greatest times of our temptation to give in to that will be when we are suffering for doing good. So let's bottom line it this way. You want a big idea, I think, in these two paragraphs, here's what we're talking about. Be encouraged by this. Listen, I want you to see this in this passage of scripture, and that is that believers can victoriously endure suffering for doing right because of the work of Christ on the cross, all right? This is why Peter's writing. He wants to encourage his readers. He wants to encourage you through the Holy Spirit. He wants to encourage me. And he wants to speak to this time when we are, are going to be most tempted to throw in the towel, to abandon the faith, to abandon righteousness, the pushback is coming. The suffering is there for doing what's right. And he wants to say, no, you can stay in the game. And you can victoriously endure when you're suffering for doing what's right, for doing good, because, not because of your strength, not because of your ability, not because of anything you bring to the table, but because of what Christ has done on the cross. So I think that's what we're talking about. Passage falls neatly into two sections. Once again, highly unlikely that we're going to get through it all. But I think in verses 18 through 22 in chapter 3, what we see is we see Christ's power over suffering. And then I think in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 4, we kind of see the practical application of that. We see the Christian's perspective on suffering. So in other words, Peter's going to say to believers in Christ, you, you, you have the same mind, you have the same perspective that Jesus did because what he did on the cross is the key. It's the key to you holding up, living victoriously, enduring when you are suffering for doing what is right. That's where Peter's readers were living. It's where we live, and I've told you, Numerous times, it's going to get worse. And so this is, this is important. It's important for us to get. Let's talk about Christ's power over suffering. I think that's what we see in verses 18 through 22. Now let me just show you that I think that Peter, he is, is speaking to that uh, from four different aspects of the work of Christ on the cross. He's going to talk about his death, particularly on the cross. I think he speaks to his burial and the significance of that. And I think he speaks to his resurrection and he speaks to his exaltation. And that's what I want to call your attention to. Right? I want you to see the work of Christ on the cross. And I want you to see it against the backdrop of this being the reason you and I can be victorious. The reason you and I can stand strong. When our friends are walking away from us, our girlfriend breaks up with us, uh, people at, at work are hammering on us because we don't live like they do or they make fun of us, whatever the case may be, whatever the manifestation of it is. Let's start, first of all, with his death. I think that's what Peter's dealing with in verse 18. We know this because the first phrase in verse 18 is, for Christ also suffered. Some English translations actually say he died. And this is the idea. Peter's not just talking about what Jesus endured leading up to his death. I think he's speaking about his death, the suffering he endured, really, that culminated with his death on the cross. You say, well, Jim, how do you know that? Well, look at the end of verse 18. He, he says that the being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So in that last phrase, he's going to contrast Jesus' physical death 
Peter doesn't entertain the idea that some have suggested, oh, Jesus just fell asleep. He really didn't die. Peter says he died. He physically died, but he contrasts that with the reality that his, the eternal part of him continued to live. He was put to death in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit. He's speaking of Jesus' death on the cross. Now, it's what comes in between those two bookends that I want us to focus on. I want you to see what he says about the death of Christ. This is really, really important, okay? So here, here's the, the, the first thing he says. First of all, he says, it was final. It was final. This is, was it just a start? This wasn't something that would have to be repeated. It was final. Look at it in verse 18. Christ also suffered. Christ also died once. And he's going to tell us why it was final. Because his suffering wasn't just like yours or mine, where we live in this world, we're on this journey and peace people are coming back. He died once because he died for sins. He died for the sins of the world. And his death was a once for all sacrifice. It was once, he didn't have to do it again. It was finalized, why? Because it was sufficient. It was enough, and keep that in mind. It was enough, not only to forgive you of your sins, but listen, come in here real close. It was enough to provide everything you need in order to victoriously endure suffering for doing good, for doing what's right. It was enough once for all. I'm going to show you some verses that relate to all of these and really kind of uh, uh, you su support them here in just a second. But let me show you the rest of it. It was final. But also I want you to notice that Peter says it wasn't fair. You ever feel like that about the way the world treats you sometimes, the way some of your friends treat you? They turn their back on you. Ever feel like that? This is like I'm trying to do what's right here. Why are people hating on me for this? It's not fair. Well, guess what? The death of Christ wasn't fair. Look at verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Notice the righteous for the unrighteous. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair that a righteous person, a sinless person, a person that's never done anything wrong would, would suffer and die for the sake of people who are always doing stuff wrong? That, that's a difference in what Christ has done. You know, you and I suffer. We suffer for righteousness sake, but we don't suffer for righteousness sake in this world because we're perfect people. We just read in Romans chapter seven, Paul says, yes, you got a perfect spirit. You have the spirit of Christ in you, but you got this sin affected body. And as long as you're in this life, those two things are gonna be fighting with one another. They're gonna be pulling against one another. I want you to notice what he says about the death of Christ. Jesus died. He died as a perfect, sinless, righteous individual. And you know who he did it for? He did it for people like you and me who are not sinless, who are not righteous. So, so Jesus' death was final, but Jesus' death wasn't fair. One other thing. Notice that Jesus' death was for something, it was for you, and it was for me. Look at it in verse 18. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why? That he might bring us to God. It's the only way it could happen. A lot of people in this life might give their life, soldiers, Somebody who, who, who jumps in front of a car and pushes you out of the way and gives their life. You know, there are people that, that maybe a friend. Paul talks about this in Roman. Maybe for a friend, somebody would dare to die. It happens, and we're grateful for those occasions, but there's a difference. There is a difference in, 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 when, when somebody in this life gives their life for me and Jesus giving their life for me. Why? Because the only way my sin could be dealt with 
The only way my sin could be atoned for, the only way it could be paid for is with a perfect sinless sacrifice. And that is the only way. When Jesus went to the cross, he stepped in between me and the wrath of God against my sin. He, he became sin for us, the Bible says. He took our place. He took what we deserve, and he didn't deserve it, but he did it for a purpose, and that purpose was that so you and I could be made right with God. Our sins could be forgiven, and we might be reconciled to him, and we might be his friends again, not his enemies. This is what Jesus did on the cross. His cross was final, his cross was not fair, but his cross was for us. His sacrifice was for us. So, so, so Peter starts at this place where he says this death of Christ, this death of Christ is where the ability that you have and I have to be able to stand up to endure begins. All right. Now, I told you I wanted to show you a couple of passages of Scripture. Uh, put these up on the screen so you know we can we can we can go through them. Second Corinthians five seventeen. Uh, some of you are familiar with this passage of Scripture. I love this verse. You know what the Apostle Paul says? He says, "He who who knew no sin, so Jesus didn't know any sin, has become God made him to be sin for us." So, so he took his son who knew no sin, sinless perfection, that was Jesus, righteous. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God. How about that? That's what the Bible says. It's just another way of saying that he might bring us to God. All right, he made us that way. The author of Hebrews the author of Hebrews is the one that I, I think speaks to this the most. Really, all three of these ideas, the fact that Christ's death was final, didn't have to be repeated, Christ's death was, was, was not fair, and, and Christ's death was for us. It was done for us. Let me just show you a couple of these again. These will be on the sp screen. Hebrews chapter 7, first place, verse 26 Watch this, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. And look at the way he describes our high priest. He describes Jesus holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners. But then he says, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and, and, and then for those of the people. So, so you see him drawing this contrast. He draws this contrast between Jesus and what the people were used to in the Old Testament priestly system. And he says he's different. That's part, of the, that's part of the purpose of the book of Hebrews. One of the things he's doing, he's showing Jesus is better. Jesus is supreme over all kinds of stuff, including the Old Testament sacrificial system. Why? Because he says those priests, they got to keep doing this. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, they got to go into the holy place and they've got to make sacrifice for their sins and for the people's sin. But guess what? As soon as it's over, it starts back over. They're going to have to do the same thing this time next year. But not only that, every day, the sacrifices that people offer, they got to keep doing them. they got to repeat them. There's continually the need for that, and it'll never be enough. And you know what the author of Hebrews is saying is not Jesus. Not Jesus. Notice at the end of verse 27 here in Hebrews 7, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself, the Lamb of God he was, who takes away the sin of the world. Two chapters over, chapter 9, he says really the same thing. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with the blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, 
He's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin, to put it away. Notice that. To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ, having offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I want one more in the next chapter since we're close here. Chapter 10 of Hebrews and uh, verses 10 through 12. Let's look at this. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Beloved, listen, this is one of the reasons why it's so important for us to understand that when we take the Lord's Supper, that we take communion, that that is not, it is not a experience of the real sacrifice of Christ being repeated, being perpetuated again. And there are those that believe that, that when we come to the Lord's table, that's what it is. It is the real body of Jesus being sacrificed. This is one of the things that prompted the reformers to say, no, we need to go back to what the Bible says because they read their Bible and it said Christ did this once and it doesn't have to be repeated. When we come to the Lord's table, we come to communion. We're not dealing with the corporal real presence. We're dealing with a symbol, a reminder that takes us back to this once for all sacrifice. Don't miss the connection in the context. Remember who's Peter's, who Peter's writing to. He's writing to people who, who are tempted when they're suffering for righteousness to throw in the towel. And Peter starts right here with the death of Christ saying, you know what, he... He did this once for all. He suffered for you, for me. That enables you and me to live victoriously, enduring under suffering for doing good. All right, so that's the death of Christ and his death. Now let's talk about his burial. And let me just tell you, when we come to verses 19 and 20, we come to what Many Bible scholars call the most difficult passage in the New Testament to interpret. And I don't want you to miss that, okay? There are conservative evangelical Bible scholars that disagree over what Peter is saying here. And it's really, really important for us to go into it with that in mind, okay? And, and here's why. Because we don't need to build our faith on something we don't have all the answers to. And there are some places in the Bible that are like that, that we wish we had more information, but we don't. And, and we need to remember our faith is built upon a whole ton of stuff in the scriptures that we can be sure about. There is enough information when we let scripture interpret scripture for us to draw hard and fast conclusions. But then there are a few places, and this is one of them, that, that we need to tread lightly. We need to tread softly. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was a good theologian. He said of this passage of Scripture, and I'm paraphrasing, he says it's a wonderful passage of Scripture, but I don't have a clue what it means. So let's keep that in mind, okay, when we come into this. This is not something to build our faith on. But I, I want to I, I, I show you some things, and, and I want to connect them to the context, because I think one of the things we can say for sure is, Peter obviously is dealing with something to do with the death of Christ that contributes to the confidence that we have in being able to hold up under suffering for good, for righteousness sake, when we're being treated unfairly. So he says in verse 19, remember verse 18, he was put to death in the flesh, made alive of the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey 
when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. (laughs) You know, I think it's kind of funny that over at the end of Peter's second epistle, he's going to talk about Paul's writings. And one of the things that he says about Paul's writings is, you know, sometimes he writes some things that are hard to understand. I want to come to this passage right here and say, look who's talking. (laughs) It's like... All right, what what is Peter talking about? Well, let me just tell you, there really have been three classical interpretations, three classic interpretations of this. I want to tell you what he is, what he what, what they are. One is that that what Peter's talking about is that Jesus preached through the prophets to the people living in their day. So in this context right here, he would be speaking about Peter uh, preaching through the prophets to people in Noah's day. He's preaching through Noah that now are in prison because they, they, they are in the prison of El because they, they rejected Noah's uh, proclamation. And by the way, there is merit to that. We know that from 1 Peter chapter 1, back in verse 11 here, when it talks about how the the Old Testament prophets were inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the suffer, suffer and glory. So we, so we know, we've already studied this, that the Old Testament prophets, they didn't have all the answers, but the Spirit of Christ was in them speaking about things, some of which they didn't understand, some of which things they did understand. So it's not far-fetched to think that Peter could be referring to the Spirit of Christ preaching through Noah to people in his day, people that rejected that and now are in the prison of hell. That's one interpretation. The second one is that Peter is is actually saying that Jesus went to hell between his burial and his resurrection, and he preached to those people, to to those people who had perished during the flood. So those same people, they rejected Noah's, uh, now are in hell. Peter, what he's talking about is Jesus goes to hell and he, he preaches to those people. That's a second interpretation. Third interpretation is similar, but a big difference. And that is that between his burial and his resurrection, Jesus went to hell and he preached But he wasn't preaching to people who had lived on earth and had rejected Noah's message, but he was preaching to fallen angels. He he was preaching to angels that had left their former place, rebelled against God, and were now being held in prison. Let me just tell you, it would be to that third interpretation that I would lean. And I'll tell you why, okay, for several reasons. But, you know, two particular that that I'll call attention to, and that is one, when he references the spirits in prison in verse 19, in the language of the New Testament, whenever this word is used and it stands alone, it's not qualified like the spirits of the righteous or something like that, it stands alone, it is always used in reference to supernatural beings. To supernatural, not humans, not humans that now had died and were in prison, but supernatural, angelic beings, if, if you will. The second one is a scripture interpreting scripture issue, and that's just a couple of references that we find. One in 2 Peter, you're not far from it here in your Bible, and if you just turn over a couple of pages in 2 Peter, uh, verse four, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And, and I know I'm just jumping in the middle of this, but I want you to see the relationship. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, I know I'm just pulling out the middle of a sentence right there. What I want you to see is that Peter talks about fallen angels being in prison, and he talks about that. Uh, really close to talking about Noah's day. It is a reflection 
of what individuals through history uh, have, have embraced, and that is that those fallen angels were in prison. They're being held there till the day of judgment, all right? Now, you'll find another one if you turn over a few more pages to the second to the last book of the Bible. The book of Jude is right before Revelation. It only has one chapter. There's a strong relationship with it and the book of 2 Peter. Uh, so, Jude and verse 6, this is what it says. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal change under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So you see, Scripture bears out the fact that there's, there's something you know, to do with, with, with these fallen angels being imprisoned. And, and, and it seems some association leading up to the time of the flood, a time of Noah, that God imprisoned these, these uh, uh, fallen angels and is holding them there until the day of judgment. Now, by that interpretation, what we're looking at here is a testimony of something that took place between Jesus' burial and his resurrection, and that is he went to this place of imprisonment and he announced, listen to me, he announced his victory would be the only thing that was that he obviously wasn't preaching to them hoping they'll get saved given the opportunity he's going there declaring his victory he's just died on the cross and I would just say to you that another thing that leads me to that is just where it comes here in first Peter chapter 3 where it's obvious that he talks about Jesus death and then when we come to verse 21, it's obvious that he's going to talk about his resurrection. And verse 22, it is obvious that he's talking about his exaltation at the right hand of God. Those things are not debatable. And consequently, it would make sense that this verse is speak, these two verses is speaking about something he did in that time of burial. Jesus wasn't dead. His body had been killed, but he was still alive his spirit was alive, and he goes and he preaches his victory to these fallen angels. Now, let's don't argue about that. Let's agree to disagree if we have different perspectives on what exactly Peter's saying. Let's do agree on what we know, and that is that Peter is talking about some aspect of the cross event, of the Christ event that gives great encouragement to those of us in this life who are tempted to throw in the towel, to buckle under the pressure of living righteously, of doing what's right for the sake of the gospel when the whole world is pushing against us. And that's something that is going to get worse. So, his sacrifice provides this power in his death, in his burial, look at his resurrection. Now, things don't get much better here by way of difficulty of interpretation, but I've already told you in verse 21, it's clear that whatever he's talking about here has to do with the resurrection of Christ. You'll see it at the end of verse 21 again. He says, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, keep that in mind. And back up to the beginning of verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the, the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And then remember, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that Peter's talking about here, it has to do with the resurrection. And that's really important when you go back and hear him talk about this issue of baptism, especially when he says something like, this baptism now saves you. Some might look at that and they might say what seems to be obvious, right? And that is, oh, see, you know, well, baptism does save you. Something that's contrary to, to, to what we have understood about Scripture. Somebody could look at this verse of Scripture and say, well, wait a sec. I mean, look, it is what it is. That, that is what he's saying. Or is it? Well, let's look at it. First of all, baptism, which corresponds to this. The word corresponds simply means it's a copy. It, you know, it's, it, it, it's representing something. Representing what? Well, he says baptism, which corresponds 
to this. This what? Well, this that he's just said back up there in verse 20. He says, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. And then he turns around and says, baptism is a copy of that. It's an antitype. It's a picture of that. It is an earthly representation of a heavenly reality. Well, what reality is he talking about? Well, he's just said there were eight people that were brought safely through this. They arrived at the other side. And then he turned, he turns around and says, that's what baptism is a picture of. That's what your baptism is a picture of. It is not just a picture of the fact that you have died with Christ, but, but baptism is a picture of the fact that God in Christ, listen to me, has brought you safely through. He has brought me safely through. And then Peter says, which now saves you. Well, it's right there that we've got to, again, ask the question, well, is that, is that what he was saying? That the physical baptism, it's, that's what saves us. This is where we have to let Scripture interpret Scripture. That could only be true if Peter contradicts himself. And, and let me just remind you about a couple of places where Peter spoke uh, to this issue Jesus has died, he's been buried, he's risen again, he's ascended back into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit is poured out in Acts chapter 2. And Peter, Peter preaches the first Christian sermon, right? Remember what he says in that sermon when he's really getting down to calling for a verdict? Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. No, it's not what he says. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He says something before he mentions baptism. And what is it? Repentance. Language experts would help us to understand here that Peter also uses a construction here in which he speaks about baptism in view of the forgiveness of of sins. That's borne out in the coming chapters in Acts chapter 3. Peter's preaching on Solomon's porch verse night in the temple and on verse 19 he says this. This is what he says to the people. Pay careful attention to this. Repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Well wait a second Peter. You didn't even mention baptism on that time. Isn't it baptism? No, the thing that's consistent in Peter's message is repentance and faith or trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't even mention baptism. The same thing's going to happen over in chapter 5 in verse 31. He says, God exalted him at the right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Peter was very clear in his proclamation that he didn't believe somebody getting dunked in water was going to have anything, was going to do anything for their eternal souls. Now, he didn't say it wasn't important. And I think that's one of the things that we understand from 1 Peter chapter 3 is that he is, he is, he is magnifying the importance of baptism. Not that it has anything to do with the forgiveness of your sins with regard to making that happen. But notice what he says even acknowledges, not as a removal of dirt. This is not doing something physical, but notice, as an appeal to God for a good conscience. The word appeal in the language of the New Testament is basically what they would do when they were doing what we think of about signing a contract. You're purchasing something or you're entering into a legal agreement. What happens? Well, you come to the table and somebody says, okay, here's what the contract says. Do you agree with this? Will you abide by this? And if you say yes, you sign on the dotted line, you're good to go. If you say no, though, they say, well, we're done. We're not entering into this. Okay. Peter's using that word and he's saying that baptism is a reflection of the appeal to a clear conscience, a clean conscience. How? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? 
because what Jesus did, watch this now, brings us safely through. It brings us safely through the point that, listen, even if they kill us, even if we lose our lives for the sake of the gospel, even if we physically die as a result of trying to live for righteousness, what Jesus did in his resurrection, what Jesus did is sufficient to bring us safely through this journey. And we find ourselves in the eternal presence of God. Peter never says you don't have to suffer. He never says Jesus will step in and he will, he, will, he will take suffering away from you in your journey in life. He just simply looks at a bigger picture of this and says, do you know what Jesus, what Jesus did when he rose from the dead is he defeated death in the grave. And beloved, this is what happens every time we, we lower someone into the water in the baptistry. It, it is somebody that is saying, I see the, the contract. I see the, the, what this, the, this is, that it means following Christ. And yes, based upon what Jesus Christ has done, I commit to that. And baptism, baptism waters doesn't forgive anybody's sin. But they are something the Bible never entertains. The New Testament, listen to me never entertains the idea of an unbaptized believer. Why? Because of that. Because of that is what is going on. It is an appeal to the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you profess Christ and you truly have repented of your sins and trusted him, but you've never been baptized, I would say to you, hear the word of the Lord today. Hear the word of the Lord today. And, and talk to somebody, one of the pastors, somebody, you know, a, a loved one, is, and talk about lining up your baptism. Not because it's what's going to forgive you of your sins, but because the word of God magnifies it as an appeal to a clear conscience because of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... Peter appeals to Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and then finally, I told you I wasn't going to get through, but we will finish chapter 3, his exaltation. Look at verse 22. Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Do you see how this all fits together. He speaks of his death in verse 18. We think his burial and what happened during that in verses 19 and 20. His resurrection in verse 21, but then in verse 22, he's speaking of the time after Jesus' resurrection when he ascends back into heaven. And here's what I want you to see. God gives him a place at his right hand. Do you see it there in verse 22? And then this, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Seated at the right hand of God in charge of everything and everybody because of his work on the cross. Now remember, keep this in context. Why is Peter saying this? Just to give us some good Christology, doctrine of Christ, wonderful stuff in here about the death of Christ. All of that, some intriguing stuff about some things we don't have all the answers to. So many things here, but remember who he's talking to. He's talking to people like, like you and like me, the people who were in a season where they were getting pushed back against their faith, they were being made fun of, they were getting rejected, and they were standing right on the heels, right at the dawn of physical persecution in which they would be thrown to lions, they would be burned at the stake, they would lose their lives for the sake of the gospel. All of that is there. Such a good picture, I've told you before, I think of where we are in American Christianity today. Not having seen that kind of intensity of pushback against our faith, but probably about to face it. And Peter writes to a people like us to say, be encouraged. 
you're going to be tempted to throw in the towel. But remember where Jesus is and who he is and what that means for you. In in closing, let me just um, read you these two verses or two passages. Ephesians chapter (laughs) 1. Don't miss this. I wish we had time to camp here. Paul is writing to Gentile believers in the church at Ephesus. He's trying to encourage them because they feel like second-class Christians. And so he starts talking about what Christ has given them. And in verse 19, he says, he has given you what is the immeasurable greatness. Language of the New Testament. It's a word from which we get our word mega. Mega is off the charts, right? Mega of his power, his dynamite, dunamis. Look at this, toward us toward us who believe according to the working this is our word energizing the energizing of his great might or strength where this come from that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in that one to come Just another way of saying is he's in charge of everybody and everything in all time, right? He's in charge of it all. And look at verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. He's already said toward us who believe back up there in verse 19. Now he says this has been given to the church. Brainerd Baptist Church, listen to me. Whether it's this season right now or any other season, churches find themselves in places where it's easy to get discouraged. Everything hasn't turned out exactly like we would write the script. It was us. It's easy to get discouraged with regard to the things that are closing in. Remember this. Remember this, that Christ has been exalted to the right end of the throne of God. He's in charge of everybody, everything in all time, and he's given that to the church. That includes you, and that includes me. The exaltation of Christ is a reminder. It's a reminder that because of him, we can victoriously endure suffering for righteousness, living for what is right. You know what he said in Philippians chapter 2, and he was encouraging those believers, encouraging them with regard to unity, things like that. And he says this, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What's he talking about? Verse 9, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's your Lord. That's your Savior. That's being described here. Beloved, be encouraged by the work of Christ on the cross. When you find yourself, listen to me, tempted to throw in the towel because you're trying to live for what is right, and yet the world is pushing back against you. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to say thank you. Thank you for this encouragement. Thank you for this reality. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us on the cross. In your burial and your resurrection, your exaltation, we rejoice in the victory that is ours over suffering because you are the victor and we praise you and we worship you. Pray you'd encourage the hearts of suffering saints today who are feeling some of this pushback. I know there are many in this room that find themselves in this place. Lord, help us. Strengthen our faith. God, for those who are here today who've never trusted Christ, we pray for strength too for them. We pray you would come to their aid and illuminate their minds and stir their hearts and change their wills. 
that they might know that you've done this for them. You have died on the cross to bring them to God, risen from the dead to put God's life back inside of them. Lord, I pray you'd draw them to yourself today and today would be their day of salvation in which they change their mind about sin and change their mind about Jesus and trust him and him alone to save them. God, we pray for that. Church, let me ask you to stand and let's worship the Lord through song before we go.
a beautiful message this morning, a beautiful song to end with. I hope that's your desire, your passion. You surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Shaddix, thank you for that reminder. What a powerful message for us to know that we can victoriously endure a suffering for doing good because of what Christ did on the cross for us. Thank you for that. Mission Serve, thank you for being in Chattanooga this week and serving us. If you want to come to my house, I'll give you my address. So you can, we got some grass and stuff. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you for serving our community so well and being with us. Church, we love you. Thanks for being a part of our worship today. And we'll leave you today, as we always do, with a blessing from Psalm 67, 1 and 2, that says, May God be gracious to you and bless you. May he make his face to shine upon you so that his way may be known on the earth and his salvation among all the nations. Church, go in peace. Have a great week. We love you.